When we have these fears and doubts, what we think we need to do is oppose it. We need to argue with it. We get in this wrestle. Stop wrestling with it. Like step aside, feel it, and then use that energy to now create a new story. So welcome to the Entrepreneur Podcast. We have a special guest here, Katie Richardson. Uh, Katie is a woman of many talents and a personal friend of mine. Um, I've known her for many years. Amazing person. Uh, just amazing. Amazing in so many different ways. Uh, always positive, always lights up the room, um, always has like the highest vibration, you know, so like just a great person in, in general. Uh, so um, Katie, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Adam, so good to be here. I'm super excited <laughs> to have this conversation. You and I always have the best conversations because you ask great questions. And today I think we're going to share with people, you know, this unique perspective of, of design thinking and how it can really help somebody in their business. Maybe first you can start off with kind of like your story, uh, kind of your background and how you came yeah. to be where you are now. I'm kind of this unlikely entrepreneur. I, uh, I I was a design student who just really, really liked making things. And in particular, I like solving problems in a really unique way. I wasn't trying to be unique, but I like solving the real problem and not kind of the surface problem. And um, so a design student met my husband there. We were having kids, you know, a couple of years after being married, and I could see how this design skill set that I had developed in school, and and also combined with kind of some innate natural gifts and talents of mine, uh, it it wasn't being fulfilled necessarily at home. And it's not to say I wasn't doing great things with my kids; I was, and very present with them, and loving being a mother. But I could see how there was this piece of me that wasn't really being stretched anymore, and that was kind of. I don't know, disappointing, I guess. And so I'm at this children's boutique with my kids. Couldn't afford anything in the store because we were living off of one income at the time. And I was feeling really uncomfortable being there. And I was about to leave. And I was uncomfortable because I couldn't afford anything in there. Like it was like $50 baby shoes. I can't afford that. And I was about to leave. And this woman kind of stops me. And she said, where'd you get all this stuff? She said it in like a really kind of aggressive tone too. And I was like, uh, what do you mean? And she, she points to baby shoes, a baby hat, a blanket, a baby carrier that I was using. Literally everything that I had sewn myself, it was my own design. I'd made it on my mom's 1962 Bernina sewing machine. And so I was a little shocked when she pointed everything that I had made. And I said, oh, you, you like this stuff? I made it. And she was like, you made this? And I said, yeah, I'm kind of a designer. And she said, oh, well, I want you to make that for me. <laughs> I'm just like, <laughs> I'm immediately like walls come up and I'm like, can't you see my two-year-old and my infant? Like clearly lady, I don't have time to make all of this for you. And so I'm like fumbling around trying to say those kinds of things to her. And she said something to me, Adam, that I really feel has totally transformed my whole life, right? It was one of those inflection points where God placed somebody in my life in that moment. And she said, look, I understand that you're really busy right now, that you have your hands full, but someday these kids are going to be in school full time and you're going to look back and you will wish that you had done something with these gifts and talents of yours. When she said that, I could not deny the truth of what she was saying. Cause I had kind of been feeling it in the background, right? Not necessarily verbalizing it, but I was like, dang it, she's right. And it was the first time where I, she, the way she even worded it, gifts and talents, like I knew God had given me those gifts and talents. And yet to go pursue a business to me was also getting in the way of my God given responsibility of being a mother. And so the, in my mind at the time, the two seemed very incongruent. And she pointed it out in a way that like your gifts and talents are not being developed in a way that they could be. And that I could not deny. And I was like, okay, she's onto something there. So I, I go home that night and I'm telling my husband this silly story. Oh, this woman said something really funny to me at the, the store today. And I, I share it with him. And I'm, cause in my mind, again, it's, it's not possible to do it all. And he was like, Katie, she's right. And I'm like, she is. <laughs> yeah. You need to do something about this. So long story short, Adam, I started a business and I started manufacturing first on a small scale, but manufacturing products that I designed. And I just, I figured it out. And along the way, I started running into what I was afraid of, which was, you know, maybe as this business grows, I end up destroying the things that matter the most to me, right? Because I could see how mean mommy was showing up by 10am. <laughs> and like, 
the little time that I was supposed to have with my husband, now I was like staying up late to work on my business, not necessarily have conversations with him and, and spend time with him. So I could see how it was kind of, it was starting to do what I was afraid it was going to do. And I'm at this new inflection point where I've actually started to build the business. It's working and it's growing very rapidly. And I'm afraid that it's going to destroy my life, the things that matter to me. And in that moment, I'm like, the kids are asleep. It's late at night. The dishwasher's running. I'm sweeping the kitchen. And I'm in this internal battle where I want to keep building my business. I have that desire, right? Because there's, there's things about me that are being fulfilled within that responsibility that just aren't being fulfilled in my other responsibilities. And I don't want to let that go. And at the same time, I don't see how the two work together. And in that moment, I had a new thought. And I think by now you can tell I'm a woman of God. And I, I like, I get in these wrestles with him. And I'm just like, look, I, I hear you telling me to pursue this, but it doesn't make sense. And I don't see how it all works. And I'm trying to find somebody who proves that it's all possible, that I can be a successful wife and mother and, and woman of God and a successful entrepreneur. And because, listen, he placed all those desires in me. So what the heck? <laughs> I'm just like in this wrestle with him. And I had a new thought in that moment, which was, Katie, you don't see the model, the, the woman who proves that it's possible for you to do all of those things, but you don't need her because you know design. I've taught you creation. While you might not see her, you can go create her. And in that moment, Adam, like I was set free. What I didn't realize is I was trying to be who I thought I was supposed to be. And that, that version of Katie was incongruent with this woman who was building a business. The two didn't match up. And God said, set that down and go be the woman that I've created the potential for you to be and go create her. And I started to realize that more than going and building a business or even building a family, right? What I needed to do first was create the woman who had the capacity to accomplish these things who had the capacity to make these difficult decisions in a critical moment and time, and who had to make the decision to live her values in a way that maybe looked different than any other person I'd ever seen, right? So that, that ultimately led me to building this business, which ended up becoming a multi-million dollar international business that got featured on the Ellen Show, Rachel Ray Show, Today Show. I've been on the cover of Entrepreneur Magazine. And, you know, built this up to a significant size while raising kids, right? I had my fourth child in the middle of having all of this. And then ultimately, I was able to exit that company six years ago. And today, I coach entrepreneurs, people who are very purpose-driven, people who have strong values and want to understand how do I continue to live my values, stay in integrity, and build a significant business. That's what they want. And, and, and I'm not saying I have all of the answers, but I, I certainly have processes and systems and especially my design thinking. Cause at the end of the day, like everything I just shared with you right now, it's like, holy cow, Katie, how did you do all of that? And the short answer is I, I took my design thinking, my design process, and I figured out how to build a business unlike anybody had ever done it before. Cause I was building me first and foremost. So that's kind of my back bio and my background story. Wow, that, that's really incredible. And just the concept of like, you know, that basically you talk to God and then basically he told you like to build the future version of yourself and kind of like, you know, move into that. That just seems very, very powerful. And honestly, like at the time, I, I, I didn't even fully, I, I couldn't even articulate it to you at that time, right? The, the version I'm giving you now is the Katie who was able to look back and connect the dots. Exactly. It's just like Steve Jobs says, you know, you can't go forward and connect the dots. You can only connect the dots looking backwards, right? You know? <laughs> yeah, 100%. Being a product designer, we, we know you're a very talented product designer. You've made amazing designs. Um, and, you know, the lessons you've learned from that, how do you uh, use them to, like, I guess, build the person you're meant to be? Or how, how do you use that technology or those the way of thinking? It's this process of the way I would describe it is reverse engineering. Stephen Covey describes it, begin with the end in mind. And a lot of times we think we know what we want that end to look like and be, but we actually haven't defined it and even visualized it at the level that makes it actionable. And so design thinking is about asking new, and I would say better questions, questions that are open-ended, questions that are curiosity-based, 
and that send you on a journey of discovery rather than just trying to have all of the answers. And so this design thinking, it really influenced the brand that I have created. I've created multiple brands now, but it really influenced how I created a brand. It influenced how I built my business because one of the things of design thinking is it acknowledges the constraints. And a lot of times we think if I'm going to live my dream life, I need to break out of the constraints. And you can't break out of the constraints until you first acknowledge that they're real, right? Otherwise, you're just going to be always living in la-la land, which never can be introduced to reality. So I'll use an example of this. Like the main product, which had my company really grow and explode in a profound way, was a product that um, it, it really innovated in the baby bathtub space. And the way that I designed this product was I first acknowledged the constraints that bathing a baby was tricky and difficult. We had this squirmy, uh, scared, <laughs> slippery, new human being, right? And we had this parent who was terrified of harming this new human being, right? And uh, you're, you're introducing water and it's, and it's in a bathtub. And, and a lot of times the infant bathtubs, they're hard plastic. They're kind of bigger than the infant because the infants grow really fast. But in the beginning, they're really kind of uh, jostling around in this hard plastic bathtub that's cold against their skin, right? That's shocking and, and terrifying. And they just want to be comforted in your arms and you're trying to get them clean. You need to get them clean, but the, the water is new and the hard plastic, it, it's all intimidating. And so what I did is I, I took a piece of paper and I said, what do I want my ideal solution to have? And so I wasn't trying to solve the problem yet, right? I was beginning with the end in mind. So if I were to imagine somehow magically I had this ideal solution, what would it look like? And it would hang in store flat. It would be easy and convenient to set up with a brand new infant in one of my arms, right? So I would need, I, I would need to be able to set it up with one arm because I got a baby in the other arm. It would need to store beautifully. It would need to be comfortable against the baby's skin. And it would need to cradle the baby really, really well. It would also, ideally... If I'm the one giving the bath, I don't want to be leaning over a bathtub and be on my knees. I just gave birth for heaven's sakes. Like, can I be at a comfortable bathing height? So I'm standing up. And so, you know, that might be saying, well, well, that's not possible. And you don't even have to ask that. So I just identified what I want my ideal solution to have. And then once you've identified the constraints, then you can kind of set the constraints aside. And you go into this new place where you're like, okay, let's dream, let's play, let's have fun. Let's think of crazy, wild, silly ideas. And that's where you go into this new place of not possible, right? Dreaming, imagining, playing, having fun. And I started sketching out all these wild, crazy ideas. Like maybe it's like a baby bidet and something wraps around it. And like, it's like a, a car wash and it's swirling around the baby, right? Like just wild, crazy, silly ideas. But ultimately what started to make sense was a concept that was modeled after a brown paper sack. And that might sound a little weird, but a brown paper sack, like nobody has to hand you instructions on how to use that. Nobody has to, like there's not some latch system and mechanism. You don't need two hands to pop it open. I mean, kind of, but you know what I mean? It's just really simple and intuitive. And I thought, what if, what if this product was really simple, intuitive, it could hang, it could like pop open the whole volume. And then when you're done with it, it, folds flat and it just gets kind of stored against the back of a door or the brown paper sack gets stored, you know, next to the refrigerator and that crack between the cabinet and the refrigerator. Right. So that was kind of the model. I'm like, yeah, I want it to be kind of like that. And that's where you just start sketching and you're like looking at the constraints now, acknowledging the constraints, but also acknowledging the dream. And in a sense, you're, you're introducing constraints to the dream. And you're like, Hey guys, meet each other. What if you two had a baby? What would that start to look like? And you start to imagine these two worlds coming together. And if if I had both the constraints acknowledged and the like fun, intuitive, uh, imaginary ideas, what if those started to live together? And you start to sketch out and play around with your idea. And there's many phases of this, but this is kind of just the general concept of how do you begin to create an idea that doesn't currently exist? I thought that was really, really cool. And then um, the other thing is, you know, how do you stay, I guess, you know, you start with the end in mind and then you stay true to this like vision during this time. 
And could you also talk about like maybe how that same process applies to also, like you said before, like kind of build yourself? So I have like a five-step process when it comes to actually creating a product and design thinking. I have this five-step process. But beyond that, so like above that, there are two phases of creation. It's first the spiritual creation of something. That means it does not currently exist in reality. Maybe it's just an idea that lives in your head. Maybe it's an idea that you've sketched out on paper, but it's not currently in reality. It's just a concept. And so we first start with that. And the cool thing is you can play around with your idea when it's just in the spiritual phase. Once you get your idea and concept really thought through and vetted, and you start to introduce this concept of reality, then you can start to go prototype it and look at manufacturing and factories. And the same is true with me. Like b- back in that, uh, what year was it? Like 2007, 2008, when I was starting to realize that I was designing myself, I literally was, this might sound really funny, but I like, I knew I was creating myself to be a woman that I couldn't see externally. And I'm a very visual person. And I was like, I need to start to know her and see her and like feel like she's real. And so I was cutting out pictures from magazines of women who I felt kind of represented what I was trying to embody and who I was trying to be in my life. And I, I, I actually Googled her recently. I found the woman. She was in a Garnet Hill catalog and she had curly blonde hair, which I have. And she dressed professionally, but she also was like, had an element of the unusual. And I was like, I like that. Like she was well-dressed and feminine, but looked powerful and strong. And so I was cutting out pictures of this woman and it was on the back of my bathroom uh, medicine cabinet. So anytime I went to put on makeup or anytime I went to brush my teeth, I would open the cabinet and there she was. And I would think about it. And then as I moved through my life and I was at these inflection points where I needed to make decisions, naturally, the old Katie who thought she needed to do certain things a certain way, right? Do what I was supposed to do would be like, oh, well, you can't. You can't go to that meeting because that would mean you have to leave your nursing son. And, and that's not uh, that's not an option. And and I started to say, well, what would the new Katie do? Well, the new Katie would take her son with her because that's like family is a value of hers. And so she's not going to say no to the meeting and the sales trip. She's just going to bring her son with her and he can help demonstrate the product because he <laughs> he's young, but that's OK. And that was me living my values and how in the world could that interrupt my ability to create sales and and get my brand and product out there. So at these inflection points, again, like the default was to initially say, oh, that's not, I can't do that. That's not possible because that was the old thinking. That was the old story. That was the old Katie. And I would pause and say, hold on a second. Who do I want to be? Do I want to keep going down that path that's like already been predetermined by somebody else or am I creating myself? And so at each of those points, I would have an opportunity to kind of play around with it and use this idea of beginning with the end in mind, you know, who do I want to be in my life? I want to be the woman who goes and does a deal with target. And then she comes home and makes cinnamon rolls on the weekends with her kids and goes to the soccer game. Like I want to be that woman. She sounds really cool. And so it was just, it was a series of identifying what my values were. And then at these inflection points, making decisions that reinforced those values and had me living my values. And oftentimes it was me making decisions that looked really strange and unusual. And sometimes I didn't even know how I was going to accomplish that thing, Adam. But I would kind of step into the dark and and lean on the faith that I will figure it out. But the only way I can figure it out is to say yes and move forward. Wow, that's awesome. And then to to hold that faith, that seems like a really critical factor is to believe that you can become this woman and that, uh, you know, you can become this thing that you're desiring. Uh, and it sounds like even just like the fact that you would see her every day in your Madison cabinet also just kind of reinforced that like, Hey, this is where I'm going, you know, eyes on the, eyes on the prize or, you know, you're focused on the, the, the destination, you know? Yeah. And I will say, so faith is an interesting word because it's very associated with religion. Right. And I am a woman who is very active in my religious congregation. I'm LDS. Some people call us Mormon. Um, I am very active in that. And I have learned that that faith is more than just this belief that God has my back. Because I do believe that. It took me a while to get there. But 
faith it's 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 a willingness to step into the unknown that to me is faith i am i'm making a decision i am moving forward and walking into the dark i don't know what the answers are i don't even know what's in there in that darkness but i have the faith that i will fig i can figure it out right and so faith is a belief in self it's a belief in god it's a, a belief in the ability to figure things out and then attaching that to action, which also requires courage, right? I, I have this faith, which then gives me the courage to make a decision and move forward and step into the dark. Wow, that's that's awesome. I just um, we have a lot of people in our community that are medical entrepreneurs, and a lot of them are women that uh, basically have stepped out and they said, "Hey, look, I want a better life. I don't want to be on call every third day. Don't be working at yeah. the hospital." And, you know, many of them like. Um, the, the stories that that we hear is just it's really it's really horrible. Like they, they don't they can't pick up their kids because they don't know when they'll ever get off. You know that kind of thing. And so, um, if someone was you know uh, listening to this um, and they were just having trouble, like maybe even you know having that faith, is there something that you might tell them or yeah, something you might totally, say? totally. So I shared that story of the store owner who wanted me to make products for her and her store, and the thing that like. I immediately had resistance, right? I immediately pushed back. But the thing that helped me move forward was I didn't know, like she was basically inviting me into a new direction and to kind of exit the path that I was on and to move into a place that I'd never been before. And I didn't know what was down that road. And that was really intimidating and was what was kind of causing some hesitation. But what I did know, Adam, was that if I continue down this path of doing what I quote, am supposed to do, what I, what others tell me I should do, that that feels hollow and empty. And that she was right. Someday I would regret that I didn't, that the Katie of now didn't do something to set the Katie of the future up for success and to put her in a position that I desired. And so while I didn't know where this new path led, what I did know is I'm not okay living with that regret. And so that has become a tool that I've used in my life because when we're at these inflection points, stepping into the dark is like often the like least fun, safe, exciting thing to do, especially when you have kids, right? And you have this responsibility. It feels, it can almost feel irresponsible to go do that thing that you are desiring to do. But it is also, I would even argue maybe even greater, a greater irresponsibility to continue to live your life on a path that you know you will regret someday. And maybe you're even regretting it now, right? And so can you utilize the pain of this future regret that you might feel someday? If we were to go into the future and look back, are you going to feel regret that the you of now did not make a change? And that is the tool that I use then. It's a tool I still use today. And like, yes, I live <laughs> on the hill in a beautiful multi-million dollar home overlooking the beaches of Puerto Rico, homeschooling my four kids. And ultimately, Adam, like, how did I get here? It's it's by these decisions that I've made at these inflection points where I'm like, hmm, am I okay continuing to go down this road? And And look, not that long ago, I was not living my values. I was like, in too many ways, I was comfortable. And we were living in a neighborhood that we've lived, lived in in a really long time, in this house that we had like made our own over 10 years, it was amazing. Beautiful yard, beautiful detached studio, things were really good in my business. And I was like, guess what? As a family, we value adventure. We are not living our values. And within a matter of weeks, we made a decision and literally packed and left. And we moved to Puerto Rico in a matter of like two and a half weeks. <laughs> And it's been the best decision of my life. And it, it was one of those inflection points where it was like, okay, I could continue to go down this road that is very clear. It's well lit. I know where that road leads. And life kind of popped open the door to a different path that was dark and unknown. And I did not have any of the answers for how to make that happen. But I knew that I wanted what was down that um, unknown road. And so when we get at that place, we have to attach it to action. We think we make a decision and we're like, trying to make it happen. And listen, if I'm honest, I thought I had made a decision that I wanted to move two years ago and nothing was happening. It's because I wasn't attaching it to action. So if you're in this place where you feel like your life is not where you want it to be, 
and you're doing the things that you shouldn't supposed to do. And you see also how it maybe isn't benefiting your family. It's not comfortable to kind of choose the new unknown path, but the you of the future is really going to thank you. <laughs> and you have an opportunity, like our power is not in the past. Our power is not even in the future. We can utilize and leverage the pain of the past. We can leverage this projection of the future, but the only place where you have power to transform any part of your life is right now today. So we can say, man, I wish I was like Katie and I'd started this thing 15 years ago, 20 years ago, but guess what? Like you have today and you can start making new decisions starting today. Does that mean you need to like pack your bags and move somewhere? No, that doesn't necessarily mean you need to make some big life altering decision like I did in that moment. Those moments are rare, but you can start making decisions today to choose to be that woman that you look into the future and you're like, I'm gonna be that woman. You can start making decisions to be her now. And that is ultimately this process of creating self. It is looking into the future saying, who do I want to be? And then coming back into your present moment saying, okay, where are my, my decisions and actions incongruent with that woman I say I want to be? And how can I make a decision right now today to be her? And you pull her into your reality. It's wild. It's so exciting and exhilarating and terrifying all at the same time. Man, that is beautiful. I think that's absolutely really, really true. And I will also just want to say, like, um, maybe you could speak to the fact of, you know, regarding children and like family, because a lot of people, they're trying to balance the two. And then yeah. there's so many people I know that they have so much promise and potential and they get caught in maybe what would be best be described as like worried about what other people think about them. And, sure. and, you know, like maybe even their community thinks about them. If they, if they do, if they work too much then they're a bad mom, or if they don't, you know, show up to a, a certain game or something or a certain event, then, you know, that's, you know, irresponsible. Um, could you talk about like just how to kind of break free from that? I've been there. I was the world's best people pleaser. And I was just, I was working so hard to make everybody else happy. And the sad truth is at the end of the day, I didn't even know who I was anymore because I was living my life to, to please others. And, you know, when you can start to ask the question, what do I want? Which by the way, that when I first started to ask that question, I was terrified. I was like, I don't know. Somebody else tell me. I hired a coach, paid him six figures. I'm like, you tell me what to do. <laughs> Cause I didn't, I didn't know. Like I had lost so much touch with my own personal wants and desires. So it, it like if you're in that place, I just want you to know I've been there too. And I, I totally understand that. And I resonate that you, you have to start by telling the truth, which is, is living life according to what you think other people want. Is it ultimately serving you? Is it ultimately helping you get what you want? Is it helping you to create the life that you want, not just for yourself, but your, for your family? And you know, in a lot of ways, entrepreneurship has been a really great vehicle for me to kind of break out of the expectation that I had allowed um, my young mind, because ultimately, that's it. Like, it's my young mind said, looked at life, looked at what my parents were teaching me, and looked at even what my faith and my religion, how I was interpreting that. I still believe a lot of the same principles I was taught at a really young age. But my mind kind of created a story for what that was supposed to look like for me in my life. And I was, I was trying to line those things up, but ultimately that was not congruent. And it was actually at direct odds with what internally, like the infinite me wanted, which was to grow my talents, which was to be seen around the world, right? Like I wanted those things and I was afraid to admit it. So, so you first have to tell the truth, like, are you living your life trying to please others? And is that getting you what you want? So if you can start by telling the truth, then you can start to say, well, if that's the case and it's not serving me and I don't want that long-term, then what do I want? That's where you start. And you start to just on your own. And I would say, get out of your head, meaning get out a piece of paper and start writing it out. It's going to scare you. You might start writing things that you've never said out loud before. And you, you're, you might even hesitate to even write it out because what if so-and-so sees it? What if my neighbor sees this? What if my mom sees it? What if my spouse sees it? And listen, I, how do I know that? Because I've been there, right? But you've got to get out of your head and start seeing with your own eyes what you're wanting inside your heart. Because right now it's just like, it's just like this general feeling that's undefined. 
And you've got to get it out and see it so you can take action on it. <laughs> that is awesome. That's amazing, Katie. One of the questions I always, you know, I guess I remember one time uh, when I first met you uh, and Ben, um, I remember there was a time where I, th I forget exactly what it was, but like something negative had happened. And I was just so impressed because you like flipped it and you turned positive like immediately. And so one of the things I've always been so impressed by you, about you is like your ability to do like what some people may refer to as like state management or staying positive, yeah. even in adversity. Um, could you talk a little bit about that and, and maybe some of your own personal practices to, to stay yeah. positive when things are maybe not going your way, you know? Yeah. I was actually just talking to somebody about this this morning. There is tremendous power in, in being positive and to like kind of see the, the bright side of things. At the same time, I think it's important to not ignore the opposite, right? So when we have negative thoughts, when we have fears, when we have doubts, our tendency, we would think, oh, I need to ignore those. I need to shove those down and stay focused on the positive. And I would say what my approach has been, is it's just a little bit different, but it is a powerful distinction. I see feelings and emotions, they're almost like food and we have to metabolize them. If we don't, then we start to get constipated essentially with all of this anger and frustration and hate and resentment. You need to metabolize those things. How do we metabolize them? We actually allow ourselves to feel them. And let me give you an example. When I first, so I, I started a podcast four years ago. It's called What's Working Now. And when I first started it, I was doing these interviews with people which is what you do when you have podcasts. <laughs> and I'm interviewing this one guy who he had reached out, wanted me essentially to be a client. And I responded to him and I said, you know, I appreciate everything that you're sharing. It's a no for me. And I didn't ignore him, right? I acknowledged him. I acknowledged what he was trying to do. And I, I told him no. A couple months later, I was speaking at an event. He was in the audience and he came up to me. He was like, Katie, I reached out to probably a hundred people like you. And I got a few yeses, but no, no's. You were the only no. And he was like, I felt something in that moment. Like it was amazing. And um, so like, this is how we met. So I end up interviewing him on my podcast. And the purpose of the podcast is not for me to be the expert. He's the expert. And so I'm asking all these questions. I'm like diving deep into his expertise. We're having this incredible conversation and we're about to end the conversation. He said, hold on, can I say something to your audience? I said, sure, what are you gonna say? He goes on and on and on. This almost gets me emotional now about what an exceptional person I am. He was like, look, Katie sits here and she interviews all these experts, but you need to know she's the expert and what this woman has done and accomplished, not just in her professional life. Can you tell it matters to me, Adam? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like um, he was, he, he saw me and he saw that not only I had built this multi-million dollar international business, but I had done it in a way that allowed me to be with my kids, that strengthened my marriage, that strengthened my faith. He was like, this is unheard of because he's a guy who helps people who have exited their companies, invest their companies. So he sees people at that inflection point and I was different. I was very different. And so he's just like pouring into the audience to make sure they know that Katie is a really exceptional human being. So it was really nice it made me emotional, even though it was super unexpected. And I hopped off. And what happened on the backside of this, Adam, was really unexpected. The next morning, I'm, you know, post exercise, I'm showering, I'm getting ready because I have another podcast interview. And in this moment, my mind starts to attack me. And it's saying things like, you're not who he thinks you are. You're not that exceptional woman. That you, You've had major failures that nobody knows about. And you're hiding things from people. And you're you're like, there are truths about you that are lurking in the shadows that nobody knows. And you are a fraud. This is my mind saying this to me. And I'm terrified. So what do I want to do in that moment? I want to ignore it. I'm like, I want to oppose it. I want to shove it down and be like, no, I'm not. I'm something amazing. I'm something special. Just like he told me what I was. But I know this principle to, to be true. If I shove it down, it will stay there. And I like build up this pain body as Eckhart Tolle calls it. And I don't want that. I don't want that to be disrupting my life and, and influencing my actions and decisions in the day. I want to metabolize it. How do you metabolize it? You open yourself up to it and you feel it. And so I did, I'm standing there in my bathroom. I'm like, and I wanted to push it down and ignore it. And I was like, no, I'm going to feel this right now. And it's 
terrifying, right? The, the overall thing I was going to feel is that you are a fraud. And I even, I remember like standing there and like kind of rolling my shoulders back and up and projecting my chest out and even like turning my palms forward. And I was like, I'm going to feel this. It was terrifying. I thought I was going to die. Like it was, it was like I was standing on train tracks and there was a freight train coming at me. It was like, get off the tracks, Katie. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to feel this right now. And I feel this like really scary negative vibration has started at my feet and it like starts to consume my whole body. And it's scary, Adam. It's like really scary. And I'm looking at my watch and I'm like, you got an interview in like seven minutes, girl. Like you need to process this fast. And I knew that moving your body helps you kind of like metabolize it. And so I like finished putting my mascara on. So I was all ready, but I'm still feeling all of these things. I run outside and I hopped onto the trampoline and I just started jumping. And I was like, okay, I felt this. And I was like, open to it that I'm a fraud. I, I felt it and I was open to maybe that is true. And I, I jumped until I only had like two minutes left and I get off the trampoline. I'm walking across the grass, across my yard towards my studio. And I felt amazing. I felt like the most undestructible person in the world. And I was so excited to step into my next interview. So I, I didn't even necessarily know like what the new belief was, but I, know, I, I did know I was not a fraud. Like that had passed, that train had passed and I was still alive and I had survived it. And it was no longer inside of me. It was no longer weighing down my shoulders. It was no longer having me in this internal battle of like trying to not believe that I was a fraud, but trying to do this expert interview, right? Like I had processed it and it was gone. And I was on to the next thing. And, and, and by the way, to finish this off, when you do something like this, you create this space within you for a new story. If we don't intentionally create the story that fills that space, life's going to fill it in with a default, which probably is not going to get you what you want. So long story short, on the other side of that, after I did my interview, I made a decision on who I am. I'm not that fraud, right? And I felt that I was open to it, but it passed. And I'm like, it's not there anymore. And I'm the real deal. Like I'm Katie Richardson. Get out of my way. <laughs> that's what that that's the kind of thing I filled it with. Man, that is awesome because so many entrepreneurs, you know, struggle with what's called like imposter syndrome, or some people yeah. might call that. And I mean, just the fact that you're able to deal with it in seven minutes and then go do a podcast interview is very impressive. So, yeah, people struggle with that for like years. <laughs> totally. And I would say stop wrestling with it. Like the more. The more, and this is like a law of physics, This we see this in Tai Chi, the more that you oppose it, you're actually strengthening that opposite belief. So if you can stop being in the wrestle with it and step aside, it like with a Tai Chi master, he gets in the ring with like a giant piece of metal, right? Big, strong man, you get the small Tai Chi master getting in the ring with a big, strong man. You can YouTube this, by the way, and you can see it. And you're like, oh, man, I can't even watch this. That, that big, strong man is going to pummel the Tai Chi master. And, you know, they're kind of dancing around and it doesn't take long before the um, big, strong man trying to use all his force, right, to come after the Tai Chi master. What the Tai Chi master does at the very last second, he steps aside, grabs the guy's arm and he's on top of him before the guy even knows what happened. Right. So he knows to how to align with the energy and utilize it rather than opposing it. And when we have these fears and doubts, what we think we need to do is oppose it. We need to argue with it. We get in this wrestle. Stop wrestling with it. Like step aside, feel it, and then and then use that energy to now create a new story. Boy, there's a big lesson in that, especially with what's going on in society. You know, so many times people oppose yeah. things so hard, and then they end up, you know, fighting that for the rest of their life. You know. Yep. <laughs> That's yeah. That's a really good point. One of the things I wanted to ask you is I was, I was recently talking to another entrepreneur and um, she was talking about how like initially she didn't want to uh, kind of like do her her business because of her children and these kind of things. But then later she said that one of the reasons why she had to do her business was because she had to show her children that it was possible and that by like not like following her dream, it would be teaching them not to follow their dreams. Exactly. And as yeah. when, when I heard that, I was like very profound. I was wondering if maybe you could speak yeah. to that point as well. And then how, how do you teach your children to follow their dreams by you living your most you know authentic life? So 
as I was in the, those early stages of business, it's easy to think, you know, my kids would interrupt my working time. They would ask for things. And I was constantly, understandably, feeling like they were holding me back. And I started to write this story that I could build this business a whole lot faster if I didn't have to deal with this two, four, and seven-year-old, right? And I noticed the way that that made me feel. It made me feel resentful towards them. It made me feel like my business was more important to them than them. And those things felt very incongruent with how I wanted to feel, which was I wanted to feel aligned. I wanted to feel like my kids were the most important thing. I wanted that to show up in my actions, but at the same time, I didn't want to let go of my business. And so I started to flip the story and I started to change it. And, you know, value, uh, family was, was specifically a value within my company, Pudge, P-U-J, which is the physical products company that I talked about. And I thought, is it possible that me prioritizing my kids and being present with them in this moment and making sure, you know, setting up my work schedule so that I can go to the piano recital, is it possible that that actually would even benefit my business? And it was almost like this, it, it, it made sense in principle, uh, but logically it didn't make sense. And yet I have also learned that as I live my principles, like, really amazing, incredible things happen that, you know, the, the, the previous version of myself couldn't figure out and couldn't connect those dots. And so I, I made a decision to actively change the conversation going on in my head. And so as my thought, my mind would say, these kids are getting in the way of the business. I actively was replacing that with this business is successful because I know how to be present with my kids. Right. And, uh, there were times when I needed to get stuff done and I needed to stay late at work. And so I brought their plasma bikes and helped them set up a obstacle course. And they were like riding through the 10,000 square foot warehouse on their plasma bikes under tables around boxes while I was having my meeting. Right. And that was me living my values. And it was, it was also my kids having a chance to see mom do things that maybe other moms weren't doing. And to kind of rewrite in their mom, in their mind, what a mom looks like and what is then therefore possible for them. And my kids are a little bit older now. My youngest is nine. And then I've got a 14 year old, 16 year old and 18 year old. And you should see some of the things these kids do. I mean, it's amazing. In our neighborhood, we had a hurricane like a month and a half ago and the garbage services just stopped and everyone's garbage was piling up. And my boys went and rented a truck and they went around to the neighborhood and they said, hey, we're happy to collect your garbage. It's $10 a bin. Everybody said yes. Everybody was happy. And like they were just enterprising and problem solving because they watched their mom and their dad live this way. And it was really fun and exciting for them. And like from a young age, my kids were involved in my business. They're, I have a really specific story I can tell. Like the Ellen Show said yes and they wanted to give away 400 pairs of baby shoes in two weeks. And <laughs> I only had one sample that I had sewn myself. And they were like, yeah, we love these. Let's give them away to our audience. I'm like, cool, I got to figure this out. So I had plan A, plan B wow. and plan C. And all three of them fell through. And I eventually like pieced it together and I got some made. But in the process, I was kind of pursuing different options. And one of them was um, a manufacturing agent out of Vietnam who said, absolutely, I can make these for you. And I just need $10,000 down and I'll start importing the factory fabrics and then I'll get the factories going. And there was something about this guy that just seemed a little bit shady, honestly. And so we were kind of nervous about putting that cash down. We were like, you know, he could just like disappear. And so Ben and I noticed how emotionally invested we were in the outcome of this thing. And like really, really, really wanted our shoes to be on the Ellen show. <laughs> and so it like was kind of getting in the way. So I remember my son was seven at the time and kids are amazing. They, they can have a very clear sound mind. And so I presented to my seven-year-old the different options. And I, I was like trying to persuade him to, to choose the like, yeah, trust this guy, send him your money. And he was like, no, it seems too easy for that guy to disappear on you and, and not actually deliver. And he was like, I don't think you should do that. 
And he was like, I think you should figure it out here. And I'm like, yeah, but that's really hard. And it's a lot of work and I'm gonna have to stay up late. And I don't know how to do that. And long story short, we, we wired the guy money. We never heard from him. Still haven't heard from him since, Adam. <laughs> like He did do just what we suspected he would do. And it was just interesting because my seven-year-old had a very sound mind. And the fact that I even approached him as somebody I respected his opinion and I valued his perspective, we have, we have tried really hard to approach our kids, at a, including at a young age, like treat them as the men and women that they're growing into, right? And to respect that in them. And, and so like that has been a way that they've been involved in my business over the years. My kids are still on the boxes of Pudge products still today. And it's just been kind of like a, a family process, right? It's like, yes, this is mom's company and you can be a part of it and here's how. So I think it's important to pay attention to the conversation in your head, you know, is it incongruent with your values and can you shift and change it to line up with your values first and foremost and you know how that lines up in reality you might not necessarily know but i i feel strongly that we can when we align with our values new possibility opens up for us that we didn't see previously Wow. That's amazing. And I love the fact that, you know, it's so true. Oftentimes like children have such a good insight, you know, they do. They are. Yeah. They don't get emotional about it. They'll get emotional about other oh. things, <laughs> but they have a very sound <laughs> mind when it comes to like decision-making when it's, when there's a lot of pressure. It's funny. I've done the same thing. I've asked my own, my son, you know, like, Hey, uh, you know, what about this? What about this? Give him like options of very complex things. And it's amazing how, he'll just come with an answer like this. And it's just like, wow, you know, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe they'll ask a question that you haven't been asking. They here, here's why it's so effective. Cause the, the solution out of a really difficult, critical moment, you, you have to approach it through a frame of curiosity because you're making certain assumptions that are eliminating possibility for you. And so when you introduce a child to the situation, they naturally have that curiosity. That's their life. That's where they live. They're in this place of imagination. And so they'll ask curiosity-based questions that you're not asking currently. That's really true. That's a great point. And then um, one other thing I just think that uh, the audience would love to hear is, you know, it's, to me, it's incredible. You've, you've built, you know, basically a huge company. Uh, You, you have your podcast, you coach people, Mm -hmm. and you still also are run an amazing family. Uh, You have great kids. Uh, you know, how do you, yeah, exactly. You homeschool. I mean, how do you, how do you, like, I'm sure people have asked you before, but like, how do you find balance and peace to do all these complicated things at once? So there's a couple different ways, things that you need to do to accomplish this. The first is, you know, how you need a daily routine that has you feeling grounded and centered. And for me, connected to God. And it took me years to really develop a routine that is as robust as I initially wanted. But if you try and like change your whole morning and you're like, I'm going to exercise for an hour, I'm going to only eat veggies and I'm going to have celery juice and I'm going to only drink water in the day and like read my scriptures and meditate. We're like, that. that is so far removed from maybe where you currently are that we're just setting ourselves up for failure. So the first thing I did is I started to develop a morning routine and it looked like this. My... <laughs> I noticed my kids, specifically my son, he was like three at the time. He was waking me up in the morning with his empty milk bottle. He went to bed with a bottle of milk, which I know is not great, but it just is what I was doing. And then he would wake up in the morning, take his empty milk bottle, crawl out of his crib, come into my room. He was holding onto the nipple of the milk bottle and he would sling the plastic bottle into my forehead. And he would say, more milk, mommy, more milk. And I would slide out of bed. This is how I was waking up in the morning. I would slide out of bed. I would shuffle into the kitchen. I would pour some milk, fill up the bottle, and I would hand it to him, and I would go slide back into bed. And, I, and But then I couldn't go back to sleep because I was awake now, but then I was mad at him. And it just was not a recipe for success. By 10 a.m., me and mommy was behind the wheel, and she had zero patience, and she was mad at everybody. Why? Because she'd been reacting to the world. So I started to realize I need to be waking myself up. I can't be reacting to him. And so it was just a few days later after I started to notice this, that my eyes popped open and I was like, he hasn't come in yet. And I slipped on some yoga pants and I slipped out of the house. And I was like, I'm going running. And 
I, I'm, and keep in mind, I'm married. Like there was an adult still in the home <laughs> who was there for the kids. But I was like, I got to take care of myself. So I slipped out of the house and I was like, I'm going to go running. I got like 10 steps into the run, Adam. And I was like, yeah, I'm not a runner. <laughs> so that was acknowledging where I was currently at. So I ended up walking around the block and it was exhausting because I, I really wasn't working out consistently at that point. So pretty soon, you know, it was a couple weeks of just walking once around the block that I would walk once around it. I was like, no, I can keep going. So then it was two times around the block. And then I lived in the Pacific Northwest and then winter happened and it started to rain. And I was like, oh, I guess I'm going to go join a gym. So I went and joined a gym. Can I tell you, I have to tell you this piece. I'm at the gym and I'm like so nervous because I haven't been in a gym since I was a gymnast in like the sixth grade. <laughs> and I'm in this gym and I'm trying to work out. And my mind's like, you look like an idiot. Everyone's watching you. And I'm like, oh, come on, Katie. Nobody's watching you. you. It's fine. Just do your thing. And this old lady walks over to me and she was like, you look like you could use a little help. Do you need help understanding how to use this machine? I was like, oh my gosh, this is embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I did it anyways. And I started to build out my routine. And over the years, I have developed this routine where I exercise, where I read scripture, where I pray, where I meditate where I have green juice in the morning. And it's been a process, like I built up to that. So I would say, start where you're at and build out this morning routine. And then the second piece, which I'm totally forgetting at this point, when you asked me the question, I immediately saw two things, I should have written it down. The first is definitely to um, create this morning routine. Ask me your question again and it'll come back. What was your question? Do you remember your question? Sure, it's like, how, do you, how do you balance everything and still find peace? Okay, so yes daily routine. And then the second is to be clear on where you're orienting yourself and where you're going. I, I think oftentimes, like before I started my entrepreneurial journey, I was, I was moving myself towards a goal and objective that some arbitrary person who I didn't even have defined had chosen for me. And that can very quickly become meaningless and not fulfilling, which is what it was, right? I was doing what I thought I was supposed to do. So the other piece of this to have peace internally, we have to make a decision on what it is that we want and we have to really define it. And I would say define it to the point where it's defined and you can feel it, you see it, and you even have some sort of a plan for how to get that. And then you start taking action to be that person who accomplishes those things. But you have to make a decision on what you want why it matters to you and how you're going to get there and start moving towards that. If you can do that, life very quickly starts to become meaningful. Why? Because you're in a place of momentum. You're moving towards something that you decided you wanted. And so the fact that you're in momentum is exciting. And the fact that you're moving towards something that you want becomes, it becomes meaningful. And like the third piece of that is you also want to be making money. Those are the three M's. You, you want to be making money on the... <laughs> on the way to, because that unlocks so much opportunity for you. Well, there's this one last piece. I had guilt and shame for so many years about getting help, specifically like hiring a nanny, hiring help in my home, like hiring a cleaner. And it, it, it I kind of reached the ceiling of where I could get to and where I could go. And I started to see how, even though I was doing all the th the things, I was in a constant state of frantic energy. I was frantic all the time. And when I finally said, you know, what if hiring a nanny helped me be a better present mother? And what if hiring a house cleaner helped me be in a better state with my kids? And what if even, and, and, and by the way, Jennifer was the one who introduced me to Instacart. I was like, what if I allowed Instacart to be an amazing assistant? And like, yeah, I paid $50 more for my Costco groceries. But what if I was like, okay, and I'm in a better state and more present with my family and less on edge because I paid money to have somebody else do my grocery shopping for me. Adam, like once I finally opened up to not just growing my enterprise, but like growing the people within my home that were helping me to do all of these things. Once I opened myself up to that, I was a better, more present, engaged, happy mother than I had ever been previously. So if you find yourself reaching that point where you're like, man, if I could just get some help, but you have the guilt that is stopping you, set that guilt aside, replace it with gratitude. I am so grateful that I can hire somebody to come and help my kids for three hours. I am so grateful 
that I live in an era of Instacart where somebody else can go do my grocery shopping for me and drop them off on my doorstep. So yes, it's, it's easy to get caught in that trap of guilt and shame. And the way out is gratitude. And, and for heaven's sakes, get some help. Yeah, that's beautiful. Well, Katie, it's such a pleasure having you on the podcast. I think you have dropped like so many, so many nuggets of gold, you know, it's awesome. Um, so, um, very, thank you so much for coming on. It's been a very great interview. And, um, if people want to find out more about you, uh, what do you suggest they do? You can definitely go listen to my podcast. It's called what's working now. If you're watching a video at all, that's what you see over my shoulder. What's working now that's on, you know, Apple podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, any podcast platform. And then I am fairly active on Instagram and my handle is Katie, K-A-T-I-E dot live. And I would say if there's anything I've said today that is inspiring you, motivating you to action, helping you have clarity, I would love to hear from you. And I mean that. So hop on Instagram, send me a DM. Yes, I actually read my DMs. Or you can send me an email and my team will make sure <laughs> I'm not as good at email. I do read my emails, but sometimes my team has to be like, did you read that email? And you can send me an email. It's just katie at katierichardson.com. And there is that website. If you want to see more about my coaching and how it is I could potentially help you, that's katierichardson.com. Thank you so much, Katie. And thank you for coming on the Medical Entrepreneur Podcast. It's been a real pleasure to have you. Adam, it's been amazing. I love your questions. I really appreciate you introducing me to your audience. And I would just say to anybody who's listening, don't just listen to my words. Sure, maybe you had some insights. But my question to you is, how can you take that insight that you're hearing from me? How can you actually attach it to action? Because that's that second piece how that idea, that concept that you're creating in your mind, that's how it becomes part of your reality. It's only through the action. So how can you take what you're seeing and attach it to action? That's my invitation to you. Adam, this has been amazing. Thank you so much. I really appreciated it.